Side Chatters, today is going to be a game changer of a show because many of us fringe enthusiasts cut our teeth on legendary stories like a crashed saucer near Roswell or the implementation of Nazi occult scientists into the American machine with Project Paperclip, and in recent years it's become popular to talk about breakaway civilizations and move towards a terrestrial explanation for the strange craft seen in the sky, often with one of the previously mentioned events, or a mix of both, cited as the genesis point for such a breakaway group. Well, today's guest has really kicked it up a notch with his research into a group of hermetic Prussian nationalists called NIMZA, an artist named Charles Delshaw, and a secret society of exotic craft makers in Southern California called the Sonora Era Club. It's a deep and rich Pandora's box of conspiracy goodness that connects some dots and fills in many gaps, taking the popular idea of a 20th century breakaway civilization and extending it back in the timeline to the 19th century beginnings and beyond. His name is Walter Bosley, and he has been here once before many moons ago on THC's 40th episode talking about his book Latitude 33, The Arcane Science and Hermetic Engineering of the Happiest Place on Earth, which is a fascinating look into real magic built into the Disney complex. And now he's back talking about his latest research that tracks the breakaway civilization back farther than most, a story that really unfolds over six of his books but is laid out most recently in his amazing $5 ebook, Origin, the 19th century emergence of the 20th century breakaway civilizations. Walter also made his living serving as a counterintelligence specialist with the FBI, a special agent in the Air Force, and as a consultant in the private sector. And lucky for us, over the years, he's used his vast knowledge of military operations and covert missions to decode chapters in our past that the powers that be would rather us not know about. It's a wild ride I can't wait to take. Walter, my man, welcome back to THC. Thanks for having me back on, Greg. It's uh, good to be here to talk with you. Yeah, man. A real pleasure. This is a huge story. And to find a good starting point, this saga suggests that certain people uncovered lost information about secret technologies that might have come from an advanced civilization in the ancient past or information brought here from off world. So I guess before we can get into its rediscovery in the 19th century, we have to establish that there was something to rediscover. So how best can we do that? Well, as I go into in the book in a couple of chapters, because it almost takes that much to establish just what you said, you know, how <laughs> yes. to do this, you really have to go back and take a look at legends of Atlantis or the uh, stories from the Mahabharata of ancient wars with advanced technology, all that David Hatcher Childress lost cities and mysterious technologies type stuff. And you got to sift through all that and really find the nuggets of what it's all about. And, And basically I distill it into the argument, the idea that, you know, hey, there might have been an advanced civilization from another place that came here a long time ago. For whatever reason, some of them stayed, they established, you know, a new civilization or colony of their world here. And they disappeared eventually, but they left behind the traces of this civilization's technology Mm -hmm. for others to find either in vaulted manuscripts or other ways of of recording the knowledge, the know-how of how to pursue these technologies, Mm -hmm. or maybe encoded in the stone remains of, you know, for instance, the megalithic cultures and things like that. But basically, you you just have to go back and, like I said, distill it into the closest thing to a nugget of truth that you can accept. And then with that as the foundation, you know, I, to me, it seemed logical. I chose to go forward on the path that over time, us Earth-based humans is, is one way I phrase it, began to find these little traces, began to find these little gems of information of the lost period, the lost civilization, and slowly but surely began to attempt to maybe emulate or reverse engineer in today's vernacular Hmm. 
what this lost civilization had accomplished. Right on. You are right. There are just tons of myths and legends that allude to beings from the sky. You know, they might call them gods, but what is the difference between a god and an ET? You can't really identify that in, when you're trying to look at Sanskrit or Sumerian texts. It pretty much is the same definition. And as an example of the plethora of these examples, talk to us about Oans. O Oannes. O Oannes. That's the way I pronounce it. Right Oannes. on. He's a Babylonian god, and I guess the possibility is that he could have been a teacher from Atlantis, coming around to give knowledge to seemingly less advanced cultures. Tell us about that a little bit. That's one of my favorite examples, because it alludes to some other things, too. Well, the way I look at it, I kind of follow the interpretation that the so-called fishman god is actually a symbolic representation of a man from an off-world civilization which possessed the technology to have and use what we call scuba equipment, essentially, yeah. you know, of their own kind. And so you see the man god depicted with the fish tail. That was our ancient ancestors' best way that they could describe a man who could walk right out of the ocean and interact in his human self and, and teach things, reveal things or such, set himself up as a god if he so desired, and then go back into the sea and swim away. Well, to our ancient ancestors, unfamiliar with, for instance, scuba technology, if one of our Navy SEALs went back in time and did the same thing, they would probably describe him as a fishman god. You know, right. um, I actually, as I state in the book, I kind of embraced the theory that what there was was a war between two off-planet factions, and that war ended up coming here at one point, or at least one party in that war ended up here, perhaps the losing party. In fact, that's what I uh, propose as a scenario in the book, is that the losing party ends up here, and they attempt to establish their civilization here, and they teach us humans that are here Little by little, bit by bit, they teach us these pieces of their civilization, their technology, and we are supposed to develop it over time, and perhaps their goal in doing that was so that we would develop a civilization advanced and strong enough to take on their old foe. Mm. That's what I present in the book, and as a possible explanation for why say, a hidden faction of this lost civilization would have a stake in planting these seeds of knowledge and maybe leading along a hermetic society or a group of alchemists in learning this stuff throughout known human history. To me, there you know, there's a logic in that. And uh, I think that it's also kind of a, no pun intended, down-to-earth <laughs> explanation because... That's the kind of thing we can understand, we can grasp, right. you know, the idea of the two factions and the one licking its wounds, so to speak, here on Earth. Of course. I think that makes perfect sense. And, of course, beings from the sky is pretty much universal with ancient cultures, and beings from the sea is also a popular motif, and it seems like potentially a collective memory of sorts. Mm -hmm. This really is interesting because I also really like hearing about Aleister Crowley and H.P. Lovecraft, and they have a bit of a tie-in to this subject as well, don't they? Yes, they do. Um, the degree was surprising to me, and it was really quite interesting to me as well because of the nature of it. In a nutshell, when I read what Peter Lavenda had pointed out in his research that Lovecraft and his creation of the story Call of Cthulhu and the whole origin of the Cthulhu mythos, if you look at the details in there, they match actual details that Crowley had written about years before, mm -hmm. right down to the description of Cthulhu as this strange, again, this fish god concept, and this name that arose in Crowley's look at this was uh, Tutulu, literally pronounced just like that, Tutulu. And of course, there's Lovecraft's Cthulhu. <laughs> Very close. Now, you know, scholars have said, well, there's no evidence that Crowley and Lovecraft ever met. And as I say in the book, too many times we have people assume that because two you know, historical figures never met. 
therefore they must not have heard of each other. Some people actually will conclude that, right. and therefore they would not be familiar with each other's works, which is really absurd on the face of it because I've never met John Irving, but I read his book. <laughs> How many of us have ever actually met the authors whose books and works we're intimately familiar with? Right. So, but I have heard that, that, you know, well, you can't show a connection between Lovecraft and Crowley, so therefore one did not influence the other. And, and that's ridiculous. Lavenda has pointed that out in great detail. So, you know, I looked at that and I saw where, you know, hey, wait a minute, that really fits in with. The whole thing about Iwanis and this lost civilization idea that I had mentioned a few moments ago. Mm -hmm. And I thought, there's just something there. And so I analyzed it with another scholar, Sesha Ree, and he pointed out the whole thing about the, the idea of the nameless ones and, and how that ties in with Nimza, this two-syllabic Nimza. And of course, there we go. Just with that word alone, we're suddenly connected to this mysterious uh, aero club and this airship mystery. These guys who use this mysterious technology, no one knows where they got it. And here's this word connecting this ancient, lost, strange tradition and this airship mystery thing going on. So mm -hmm. the closer I looked, the, the, interestingly, the more it made sense that there was some type of line of connection there. Right. Okay, so based on descriptions in the Mahabharata, ancient cave drawings that look like plasma discharges, and descriptions of the gods, we do get a good sense that there's something to know. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the reconstruction. What can be said about the tracking or uncovering of some of this stuff before we get up to the 19th century? How far back can we go? We can go as far back as we know the hermetic uh, tradition you know, hermetic organizations, the organizations that were conveying through their, we call them secret societies now. Right. As, as far back as the histories of those go, that's how I believe we can trace the carrying out of this knowledge. Because I think it was through these hermetic organizations through the centuries that the guys in the 19th century came to know this information. Right on. And in the book, I think you started or the, one of the major nodes on that timeline would be Alexandria. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I guess you go to the Knights Templar, sure. to Freemasonry. Right, exactly. The uh, Library of Alexandria, as we've heard and is documented throughout history, was really the place where a lot of this knowledge was gathered in one place. You know, and this was what we call the the so-called pre-flood, whatever that disaster was that right. our traditions have mythologized into the Great Flood, whatever that disaster was that struck the earth. The Library of Alexandria w was said to have had all this knowledge, the the wisdom, the technology, and such prior to that cataclysmic event, and then of course after the destruction of the library by religious maniacs, both Christian and Muslim, that were responsible for destroying that library. This information is dispersed and ends up in various places. And yes, that's how the Knights Templar, who we know operate very much like a hermetic secret society, mm -hmm. that's how it gets into their hands. Primarily in the Fourth Crusade, a lot of it from Constantinople. And then from there, I think most of your listeners are probably familiar with the Templar and their tradition and what they're involved with and and uh there it is in europe you know they bring it to europe and that's how your prussian organizations your prussian alchemists your prussian hermeticists that's how it gets into their hands because of the german faction of the the knights templar excuse me i'm doing a complete brain teutonic. the teutonic knights thank you very much you got it. because the teutonic knights were among the beneficiaries of this information during the fourth crusade mm-hmm and voila, there's your Prussian connection right there. So mm -hmm. whatever organization, Hermetic, Secret Society, whatever you want to call it, alchemical tradition, whatever, between the Teutonic Knights and these guys in the 19th century, and I point out by name in many cases who that could have been in the book, there you go. There's your line. And it's the line that we're aware of. Who mm -hmm. knows what we're not aware of? Right, right. And of course, broad strokes, but... 
Alexandria, to the Knights Templar, Freemasonry, the Royal Society, to the Angelic Society, to these Prussian nationalists via the Teutonic Knights. And uh, well, remember, remember from the Library of Alexandria, a lot of this information, as I point out, was in two or three other similar locations. And so you do, I do identify that step between Alexandria and Constantinople that is the logical step. But yeah, you got it. That's that's the trail. There is no hole between Alexandria and Constantinople that's wide and gaping. There is a connection in there, but yeah. Right on. So this is where, you know, fuel really gets thrown on the fire when this information reaches this Prussian group that the book and the saga is largely about. Tell us about the Nimza. The Nimza. Wow. What do we know about the Nimza? Um, within the context of the airship mystery, Nimza first chronologically arises with this mysterious Sonora Aero Club of Sonora, California, the the gold country west of Yosemite. Mm -hmm. And Nimza is, according to Charles Delschau, the secretive German organization that oversees what the Sonora Aero Club is doing, and not just the Sonora Aero Club. Delshaw alludes to there being other groups, but he does not identify them. He, in his story, in his writings, says that he was sent by NIMSA, on behalf of NIMSA, to go visit the Sonora Aero Club and observe and report their progress. And he ends up really liking these guys, thinking they're pretty sharp, especially the leader of them, Peter Menace. And you know, he gets involved with their activities. He never identifies what NIMSA specifically means. He always spells it out in all capital letters, like an, an acronym. Mm -hmm. It's just always shown as an acronym. And it's N-Y-M-Z-A. And many people have, or a few people have tried to translate what that meant because in the 1890s, 40 years later, remember, we have an airship mystery that was in all the newspapers and often gets talked about these days in relation to our, our UFO phenomena. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And NIMSA is mentioned during that period. Some researchers point to the NIMSA being involved with the part of the airship mystery of the 1890s that is connected to a man named John W. Keeley who was doing stuff on the probably on the same level of advancement as Tesla, but coming about it from a different angle. And so we have this NIMSA connected with the Sonora Aero Club that emerges with the writings of Charles Delshaw, which are discovered in the late 60s by Pete Navarro. But then we have the NIMSA connected with the what is chronologically 40 years after the Sonora, Sonora Aero Club, connected with these New York money men and Keeley, who was also in New York and such. So people had a tendency to want to interpret NIMSA and YMZA as New York something or other. Mm. And one of the best was the New York Motor Zephyr Association for lack of a better thing. And, and you know, it made logical sense when you just looked at NIMSA within the New York context. What I did, however, was I said to myself that, that really Delshaw is the guy who connects NIMSA to the group in the 1850s. And they were a German group with a few Italian immigrants, but uh, they were this group of German immigrants in California doing this. And Delshaw said, NIMSA was headquartered in Germany. So I thought, if we're going to interpret this or hope to identify it, we're going to have to look at it in German terms, not limit it to New York, and why, in my opinion, might mean something else. So I kind of reverse engineered the acronym, looking at various German words, and I did come up with a translation a proposed translation, which I couldn't repeat it to you right now <laughs> if you paid me. But it's all in the book, in the German, how and why I translated it the way I did. The fact that I did consult people who were more expert with the German language, and they in turn consulted native German speakers 
And, you know, I, I've only had a couple of people say, well, I wouldn't interpret it that way. Most people, and I mean people familiar with German and the native speakers, have agreed with my interpretation that I didn't get crazy with the language. It makes sense to them. Right. And basically what we end up with is NIMSA in the 19th century into the 20th century context was a Prussian nationalist group, not an official German group. You have to remember – in the 1850s, the Germany we know today was still trying to form. What it was back then was a bunch of states trying to come together with a German identity. Mm -hmm. And this German nationalism, national identity, was being led by the, the Prussian element. Okay, mm -hmm. And so this NIMSA, in my opinion, was a Prussian nationalist organization. So therefore, it was private. It was not a government entity. Mainly because the government they had at the time, you know, would not have been able to do something like this. It was a private organization, like like a government contractor today, that had at its disposal bankers, people with the money, and the industrialists, and of course the men that would have had the knowledge. And I identify several of them from the period, and then going through the rest of the 19th century into the 20th, all the way up, showing the logical progression connecting them to the Nazis of World War II fame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, like I say in the book, what I'm trying to do is pick the best possible candidates, the, the, the best possible suspects. If this NIMSA organization that Del Shell says existed really did exist, and if the logic that I've followed is how and why they existed – what I did was I looked at the the men at the time who would have been the most likely suspects, okay? Mm -hmm. And then what's interesting is those guys led up into the late 19th century, early 20th century. They led to the Nazis, okay? Right. And we know, we know that the Nazis were doing some pretty spooky stuff technology-wise. We suspect that they were inspired in some cases by – maybe lost ancient knowledge that they had uncovered. But the biggest shocker was the connection of this 1850 Sonora Aero Club technology to the Nazi bell. That was a doozy. Right. And I do want to get into that, but I wanted to throw out a quote from your book where you say, it is in the 18th century that we find our most direct influences on the Prussian circles that were likely to have inspired the men who would pursue airship technology in the following century. The humanist age of enlightenment was a period of much alchemy and mysticism in the kingdom of Prussia. And I love that. And it seems like, you know, what Dr. Farrell would call the hidden side of physics. A lot of people were messing with this stuff at the time. Tesla and mm -hmm. this Peter Manis guy also. But, you know, it makes me wonder what happened, because, of course, the Vatican had a serious campaign to ban magic and mysticism and kill off people using it. But even years later, we hear that Isaac Newton had a huge alchemy library. How did this movement of philosopher scientists, as you say, get so overrun by material scientists? Well, quite frankly, they got outnumbered. This is what happened, uh, you know, and we can jump over to the uh, Burton book in that particular instance because I talk about that in the Burton book, mm -hmm. how they just simply got outnumbered. They got outnumbered by the bean counters, the guys that were just all about it's got to be pure, 100 percent materialist. Count those beans. <laughs> we don't want to hear any philosophy, you know, and – in 1830, I believe it was, when these guys, the bean counters, the materialists, finally just outnumbered the other guys, they just took a vote and essentially took over the Royal Society. And this is what I'm referring to with the bean counters is the Royal Society because mm -hmm. that's the context of the Burton book. And that's an example of what happened across the board in this murky world of of science and technology and philosopher scientists and hermeticists in the 19th century it was just simply numbers darwinism and atheism became much more popular and there you go it was very easy to embrace the material side of things and and you know think about it it is logical you know there you are trying to understand things scientifically you want to be able to recreate your results in a lab, right? That's what the process is all about. Do those experiments, recreate those results. You know, we can say this is so. If you do this, this will happen. And that's how, yeah, 
our understanding of the world around us through science. That's how it advanced greatly. And we have all this great stuff. I mean, it makes sense. It's logical. However, I think it is also a case of maybe throwing out the baby with the with the bathwater. Of course. I think when the materialists took over in their enthusiasm, they were kind of like the snarky trolls of their day. Uh, <laughs> when they when they took over, you know, they just cast it all out. When maybe they should have kept those little nuggets and gemstones that the philosopher scientists, the hermeticists indeed possessed because i think you know you mentioned before the hidden physics i think the guys driving the hidden physics that we suspect and we see little glimmers of evidence of i think that they did not throw the baby out with the bathwater i think they they kept the little gemstones and uh pursued a a different way right now i'm with you there so Let's talk about how these airships would fly. Like you mentioned, it's connection to the Nazi bell technology because people look at these images of Del Shower, they hear the 1897 airship mystery and they think, okay, somebody had hot air balloons or something. That's absolutely not the case. Talk to us about the soup, Peter Manis, and, and how these things worked. Well, here's the interesting thing. Again, we still don't know exactly what we have or the descriptions that are left to us in the works of Del Shao and in in the witness reports and the airship mystery. You know, I'd like to throw out there too that I've heard scholars, alleged scholars, just completely of the UFO phenomenon in history. These scholars will they'll only go back as far as World War II. In some cases, only as far back as 1947 with Kenneth Arnold, which is hilarious that they stopped there. And if they go back farther. They don't really dig into the airship mystery, and I've heard them – You know, they do it often. They just dismiss the airship mystery, and they repeat something that's not exactly true. They repeat this idea that all these airship sighting stories in the papers were all an April Fool's joke. Well, these things were reported for months, not just in April You know, of the given years, 1896 to 1897 and so forth. These things were seen by hundreds of people, thousands of people over cities and such. And when you take an honest look at it, you find that these guys who were dismissing this as just a big April Fool's joke or these newspaper men made this all up. All the newspaper men across the U.S. made this all up because, wow, it just suddenly, you know, allegedly made them millionaires because it mm -hmm. sold so many copies. No, that wasn't the case. And an honest researcher, an honest scholar will find that the dismissal is based on really just kind of a lazy falsehood. When you look closely at this, you see that the technology described and depicted by Delshaw in his drawings is curiously just like what people were witnessing in the 1890s. Only, of course, in the 1890s, it was more advanced. But it involved rotation, these objects that spin and rotate, and it did involve this stuff called soup, which Del Shell spelled S-U-P-E, because remember, he's from Germany himself, and he was struggling with English there for a while. But he called it soup, and it was this green liquid that only Peter Menes knew the exact ingredients of. And with this soup, the small amount of this soup in this vaguely described motor, Peter Menes and the other guys who successfully flew their arrows, that's spelled A-E-R-O, who successfully flew these things, essentially achieved a form of anti-gravity, which could also provide propulsion. What's really interesting is in the 1890s, the witnesses, there's one in particular that's uh, brought aboard one of these airships, and he sees spinning apparatus, okay? And it's activated by a gentle tapping of these flanges of metal, fingers of metal that just kind of stick out from whatever the propulsion device is. And the pilot just kind of gently taps it. So there you have a vibration, which then starts getting everything rotating. And this, this spin, it just, with the vibration and the spin, it activates this anti-gravity effect. Hmm. Now, you've got the spin, you go back to Menace, you've got the soup, the liquid. 
Now jump ahead to the World War II era with this Legend of the Bell, which Igor Wachowski and Joseph Farrell have, and others have written about. And what do you have? You have this object that's two parts that rotate. They counter-rotate, but they spin one set inside the other. And what's pumped between them is this serum, this you know, secretive uh, serum recipe. So that sounds like Peter Menace. You got the rotating object and you've got the strange liquid, but here's the real kicker to this. In a couple of Del Shaw's drawings, one of the central pieces of the apparatus that make these arrows fly is a rotating spinning object that is shaped like a bell. <laughs> And this was drawn years before, we're told, the Nazis started messing with the bell. Right. And it's depicting something that he said was used in the 1850s. Well, that right there led me to follow the thread, which I lay out in the book in detail, showing how this technology used by these German guys in California secretly led to the same kind of technological idea in the 1890s airships, but more advanced, and then how that would have led to what the Nazis were doing. And what's the thread we have through all of this? We got the German guys in the beginning who were doing this, and then you got the, the German Nazis. Mm -hmm. And I explain in the book about the American group that stood up during the Civil War era, the post-Civil War era. Right. And how it connects into all of this, but how still the Germans were in there. Because you had mention of NIMSA connected with the airship mystery. And that goes into how I point out and why I point out that I think there were two factions doing this. Right. At that time. But the point is you do, and, and the book demonstrates, the German thread that runs through all this. So you see there is a logic behind where the Nazis might have got this information to begin with to start messing with something like the bell. Yeah, I love it. I think it's such uh, an interesting saga. And it, like I mentioned in the intro, it extends the timeline. We hear about this one pocket of time with the World War II era, but it doesn't go prior to that. It doesn't go back into history further. And um, I think you're nailing on some really interesting stuff. And talk to us about telluric currents in the earth this is also part of the technology right yes i think personally that if you map out where the sightings were reported in the 1890s mystery and when you look at where the sonora aero club was active those of you who have heard me before and are familiar with my work know that i have presented information regarding the idea that there are telluric current ley lines to popularly phrase it Technically, a ley line is something else, but, you know, it has become to mean these energy lines through the Earth connected to the world grid. Essentially, these are what power the world grid that Tesla talked about and worked with. And in my opinion, when you map out the airship sightings and the activities of the Aero Club, you find that they correlate to where these telluric currents have been identified or proposed to exist by scholars other than me. I do have a map created for me in, uh, sent to me in 2009, 2010. The, the date is on the tube when I received it in the mail that predates my writing of this stuff. And so I referred to the map and there it is. I mean, the, uh, the, the sightings of these airships reported in the 1890s, there they are. Just they, they kind of, you, you can see almost like where they would have followed these currents like a track almost. And mm -hmm. I argue, I propose in the book, I suggest this, that these airships connect themselves to the world grid. That's kind of part of how they work and what they follow. And when you're familiar with what Tesla wanted to do with ships at sea and aerial platforms, he also was going to power them with the world grid. So it's certainly not an original idea with me. I was able to just show where, hey, what Tesla said looks like maybe somebody was already doing. Yeah, man. And 
you know, or you can also throw UFOs in here with this Nazi bell and airship stuff because we're talking about anti gravity. We're talking about rotation, which is, you know, textbook flying saucer stuff. Right. And, you know, also there are people who have written books about the fact that flying saucers, if you map all the sightings, they exist along a couple of certain parallels. They've acknowledged that there might be a connection to the Earth grid. So I think you might be onto something there. You know, I, I, I think so. We'll see. <laughs> um, I always like to say I could be completely wrong about all this. Right. So <laughs> it's this is not an area where we get a lot of definitive answers. That's true. Right. You kind of have to decide for yourself when you look at the evidence that's out there. Right. And, uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit about the vibration, um, the tapping of the, the technology and sound and vibration technologies are something we've heard about before. You know, that's the implication at Coral Castle. Mm -hmm. Have they come up in any other area of your research in uncovering the types of technologies and sciences that these secret groups were looking at? Well, here's the interesting thing. This whole thing with sound and vibration was very deeply a part of the work of John W. Keeley, who I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And how Keeley got tied into this whole airship mystery was due to his very controversial, I might add. He was called a fraud in his own lifetime and, you know, very controversial. But he was the darling of the New York spiritualist and what we would call New Age set of the time, which happened to also be part of the you know the, the high society the wealthy the people that were supposedly the financiers of some of these airships and such which is where they got the idea that it was a new york based group because there were new york investors according to um, you know the airship mystery and del shaw and such so there you have it you've got a guy who was essentially the tesla of sound and vibration type technology of his day. And those two guys, I don't think they ever met, but they were both up for, uh, they were competing against each other at one point in the late 1800s for money from, I think it was Astor, hmm. who, you know, I go into that in the book, of course. And you also have then later in the 20th century, you have Victor Schauberger, who he got into the, the whole thing with rotation and the flow of water and such. And basically, what are we talking about here? Between Tesla, Keeley, and Schauberger, you've got these guys who were taking their discovered knowledge of little known or maybe little noticed natural forces and doing things with them that people hadn't done before. That's what's so interesting to me about the notion that this is lost technology or lost information because we think of our technology and things like iPhones and satellites, and they're very mechanical, you know, obviously they're very man-made. And we think of all the things that you need to get to before you get to something like an iPhone or a satellite. Right. And then you try to extrapolate that in the ancient world. It doesn't really work because we don't have a bunch of uh, trash heaps everywhere, you know, sitting outside of Gobekli Tepe or something. But these more natural technologies that seem to be just as powerful, if not more, and embedded in the earth or in our environment i mean this might get into something like ether theory and alchemy but th this stuff is is really where the money's at for me because it just makes so much more sense that any civilization or culture could pick it up and develop it right so right on uh on the subject of the relevancy of this aero club being in southern california you tie it into the california gold rush in 1849 because these guys messing with this stuff are into esoteric arts and alchemy. And you note that when you say, we've all heard of alchemists making gold, but might they not also possess knowledge of where and how nature processes gold? And that is a pretty big eye-opener, man. Talk to us about that piece and how this might be relevant that the gold rush took place in the same area where these guys are messing with this kind of stuff. We'll see. And isn't that interesting right there, just what you said? I'll tell you, the... The most I know about it comes from a guy who I mentioned before, Seshari, who wrote a book titled The Handprint of Atlas. Now, Mr. Hari has kind of withdrawn from public life, and he asked me to um, take all his books off the market. Mm. I published them through my company. And so his books are no longer available, but somebody out there might have a copy, a printed copy of The Handprint of Atlas. And in that book, he describes how, yes, the powers that be, so to speak, through these kinds of things I'm talking about, how airship 
mystery clubs form, you know, you get guys with knowledge, right? And these guys with knowledge find their way into government positions, you know, leadership positions in organizations that have the means to pursue things like gold mining and such. But somewhere along the way, these guys had figured out how to read the terrain of the earth and how to read, you know, they probably did a little reverse engineering where gold had been found prior. And they figured out that they could identify by a particular geophysical feature, which Mr. Hari identifies as a hodge in his book. Hmm. And they would identify these hodges, which are like little round mountains with not sharp pointy tops, but round mountains. Mm -hmm. And it was at somewhere around the base of the hodge is where you would find this black soil or sand or whatever. And, and that was their clue. Now, Mr. Hari describes this much better than I do in his book, The Handprint of Atlas. And he also suggests in that book that the gold rush of California of 1849 was a staged event because the United States wanted California. And so one of the best ways to get the state would be to have a bunch of Americans just flood the population. This should sound familiar because this gets talked about today, how, you know, that is one way to take over an area, just flood it with your folks, and then you can stake a claim Right? how many of our people we got there. <laughs> and this was a tactic that Seshari claims the U.S. used, and so therefore they knew that the gold was there at Sutter's Mill or whatever the places that he says they knew the gold was there and they were just waiting for the moment and they chose their moment to do this stage, this Eureka event. And then everybody rushed in there. Of course, when you look at the gold rush, the people who made money were the people who supplied the dry goods and the clothes and the tools and set up the towns and had the saloons and stuff. The guys going to look for gold, very few of them, <laughs> you know, actually yeah. found any. So it was building an instant population and standing up instant industry, and then that resulted in instant towns, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, subsequently, you know, things went the way they wanted it to. So this idea that they could read the terrain and know where the earth produced gold, that suggests what other kind of things did they know? And, of course, when you look at the history of telegraphy and what, when you know the facts about telegraphy and the railroads, you see that, well, one of the other things they knew was this telluric current stuff, mm -hmm. because telluric current is a reality. And the telegraphers, you know, the guys who did the little telegraph that did it, did it, did it with the Morse code, which the railroads stood up, they strung this, they set this up along the lines of this telluric current, which they knew was there. And if you follow railroad lines and railroad tracks, the railroad lines also followed this current. It went hand in hand. So... This is all going on in the middle 19th century, and and it's out there in a certain milieu of engineers, and it, it's kind of like an open secret. There was just these guys who they understood the principles of things that maybe the general public didn't know, mm -hmm. and they used it to their advantage. Yeah, it's fascinating. There always seems to be a conspiratorial subtext to events that we remember in the past, but the gold rush is... Nothing I've ever heard be brought up. I've never heard anyone try to read between the lines of that. So that's really interesting. And uh, we also did a, a recent show where I had a guest talk about evidence that points to the Amazon being a product of advanced permaculture practices put in place by ancient humans. And it actually made me wonder if something similar couldn't have happened in areas of high gold production. Could an area of the earth be engineered to produce a lot of gold is this something they could have known, how to tweak their environment to get gold out of it? Well, that's a very, very interesting suggestion. And, and I would lean towards saying, yeah, I, you know, I, I think there's something to that. I have a cumulative result of my research and stuff is I'm, I'm in the camp of the uh, possibility that the, the earth has been machined or is in some way some big bio machine. Mm hmm. And sure, you know, my personal view and the environmentalists are just going to love me as much as the ET hypothesis UFO people. <laughs> but uh, my view is, is that human beings, we're essentially nomadic. 
and uh, we go from world to world, and you know we use the resources that are there. And when that world's used up, time to go to another one. <laughs> I do not buy that the Earth is this sentient being with its own personality and awareness of itself and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it has living things on it, and it, it has this ecosystem, but it is essentially... Now, we're not supposed to crap on it. We're not supposed to treat it like crap. Of course not. It's our home. But we are, in my opinion... We're supposed to, you know, use it and survive on it and build our civilizations. And then when we're using it all up, it's, like I said, time to move on to the next world. <laughs> and uh, I, I think if there was a civilization that was way more advanced than anything we've had or aware of that we've had, it's very possible that they might have had a technology where they could, you know, have come here and known how to engineer certain things. Again, I refer to Seshery's handprint of Atlas. He kind of goes into this very thing where he thinks this off-world civilization did kind of, if you remember the Star Trek movies and the Genesis machine, he thinks they did kind of a Genesis number where you had this globe, whatever condition the Earth was in, whatever stage it was in, and this off-planet civilization injected this massive device and he says that the impact point was what is now Lake Victoria in Africa. He argues that that's what the Royal Geographical Society was really after. Mm -hmm. That's what Burton was really looking for. They were really looking for the evidence of this point of impact of this object that then re-engineered the ecosystems of the Earth to suit the uh, off-world civilization's desires. Mm -hmm. That's his theory. He <laughs> points it out in this book in detail, but it follows along the lines of what we're talking about here, and sure. uh, it's intriguing. Yeah, man, that is a great story. I all, Another little side story I like that I picked up from your book as it relates to ancient technology is from when Napoleon went into the Great Pyramid alone, and you say that according to the lore, Napoleon emerged from the Great Pyramid in a somewhat unnerved state. When allegedly asked what happened inside the chamber, Napoleon is claimed to have replied, what's the use? You'd never believe me. And uh, I love that, man. Provocative. Can you elaborate at all or speculate on, on what he might have experienced? Well, here's the thing. Also, unfortunately, what happened was the source of that story then apparently later denied it. So you kind of have to take it for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Was the guy telling the truth and then someone told him, hey, cut that crap out. We don't want to talk about that. And so later he came back and denied it. You've got to decide that for yourself. But I would say, you know, you hear these things about what the pyramid might have been. In my opinion, I agree with it. It certainly was not a tomb. They never found anything inside there that ever even indicated, much less proved that it was a tomb. But it's easier for people to believe it was, so we'll let them keep on believing that <laughs> and uh, feel all superior. <laughs> but uh, it's possible that if it was some type of machine, maybe a psychotronic device, like I say Disneyland was at one time, mm -hmm. it's possible that when he laid down in that chamber, it activated something or whatever residual effect one could experience from what remained of the structure, perhaps sent him on a little a little brief mental trip there. <laughs> and so I would say if anything, you know, you're talking some type of psychotronic effect. And that would be my best explanation for for what it would have been. Unless there was some apparatus in there that they found intact that they removed mm -hmm. that is hidden from history. Yeah, that is a possibility, but I think that seeing, you know, how the Egyptian culture seemed to value the spiritual plane and knowing what I know about entheogens, I think there's a good chance that that might have been some type of psychedelic machine that uh could get you there maybe without the drugs or maybe they they loaded up and then got into it or something, but uh, Well, you know, I I'll, I'll say about that what I like to say about a lot of things I write is I let the listener or the reader decide for themselves, right? <laughs> Fair point. That's I like to do that here too. So if we get back to these breakaway groups, because there are more than one, uh -huh. and um, you know what makes them tick is often funding. Usually that is a point of studying. Can you tell us any more about the backers of this underground group or groups? Well, you have, for those interested, I, I go into detail. I 
identify German bankers specifically who I think would have been these mysterious financiers and the New York bankers as well. As a matter of fact, in origin, I, I list out both of them, the uh, most likely suspects, because these were the banks that existed in those days when the sources like Del Shao and the newspaper reports of the 1890s refer to financiers and bankers. What I did was I said, okay, who were the bankers of the day? Mm -hmm. So I went back and looked through the history of it and I identify, here you go. I was able to trace the line between the early to mid 19th century industrialists and bankers and hermeticists leading to the 1890s era counterparts of these guys. In some cases, you know, of course, there's overlap. Some of these guys were still around, just like the guys during the 1890s mystery were some of them were still around in the early days of Nazi Germany. And I show the line there between the guys that would have been financiers, bankers, and industrialists, German or New York, mm -hmm. during the 1890s mystery, the ones that would have been connected to the foundation of Nazi Germany and their pursuit of this stuff. And it's it's very intriguing when you look at this whole mystery from that perspective. Right. You know, it's all well and good to talk about, ooh, we saw this machine and ooh, it flew and wow, what a mystery. And, and yeah, and it was – these things were built by New York bankers and rich men. <laughs> well, except in the case of Astor or Rockefeller or whatever, most scholars had never taken a close look at who these money men were. And the interesting thing I found was the closer you looked at who these money men were and these industrialists, you find that they were connected to, say, Nazi Germany or – the German war machine of World War One, and it just kind of begins to make even more sense that these are the guys who would have been behind pursuing something like this mysterious and secret airship technology. Right. It is an eye-opener, man, because what we're really talking about is Germans getting a foothold of power in the United States as early as like the Civil War era. Right. And it, it goes further from there, but it makes – Something like Project Paperclip seem a lot more natural when you just sure. think about the infiltration. And what's also interesting is you do mention Brown Brothers Harriman in this, and mm -hmm. that's strong accord with <laughs> me because Prescott Bush worked for them. And you write yes. a lot about German organizations getting that foothold long before yes. Project Paperclip. And I wonder if Bush might have known anything about this stuff. You, you know, you touched on a big one there. Uh, <laughs> this started. This foothold really got a, a, a its first deep impression with Kuhn Loeb, okay, the German banking organization that was here in America, who at one time, they, they were the guys behind a lot of the railroads. You had all these different railroads throughout the country and, right. and you know, competing with each other. But Kuhn Loeb, they were the bankers that had their fingers in all those railroad pies. And at one time, they physically – they owned 65% of the physical railroad in the United States. So think mm. about that. You know, <laughs> you have these German-born bankers who had their connections to Germany despite being an American institution. And they pretty much financially controlled the railroads, which meant telegraphy, which also tied in with the knowledge of the telluric current. So therefore – what did they know about? I identify them as being involved with the airship NIMSA. But uh, Kuhn Loeb were the backers of E.H. Harriman when he purchased the uh, Union Pacific Railroad for uh, what was then considered a ridiculous overpayment. But he wanted it, and Kuhn Loeb backed him up. Well, E.H. Harriman is the the subsequent Brown Brothers Harriman. That's where the Harriman name comes from. And, and Avril and, and Bunny, or Avril might be Bunny, but the Harriman brothers, who Prescott Bush was friends with, were the sons of E.H. Harriman, you know, that are connected to Kuhn Loeb. And I spell all this out in the book, and it shows, again, the thread between the mid-19th century stuff that was going on with all this in the background and leading right up into the World War II era with the Germans, because we know that Prescott Bush got in trouble during World War II. He was, uh, I believe, indicted for providing banking services to 
to Nazi Germany, mm-hmm. to to the you know the official Nazi administration, as it were. And what's interesting is you know his own son is a U.S. Navy fighter pilot <laughs> fighting this war, and there he is connected. It, it's very intriguing, and kind of half pisses you off. <laughs> <laughs> but sure. uh, a lot of people, you know, are more than half pissed off when it comes to the shenanigans and mysteries of the Bush family history, right? <laughs> Right, no doubt. (laughs) Wow. Well, on that note, (laughs) this has been awesome, man. That just about does it for my question. Thanks for laying out this amazing saga, The Secret of the Nimza. Would you like to remind the people of the work you got out there and where to get some of this sweet Bosley action? (laughs) (laughs) Um, You can get it all on uh, Kindle at Amazon.com. And um, you can also get it, if you prefer printed books, you can go to lulu, L-U-L-U dot com. And uh, I also have a blog, empiretheweel.blogspot.com. When I'm busy working on stuff, I don't update it frequently, but there's some really good essays and stuff there, um, along with some links. And remember, even if you don't have a Kindle device, Amazon gives the Kindle app away for free, so you can download it onto any device so that you too can uh, read Kindle books. So... Um, that's about where you can find me. Very cool. And you did allude to this earlier, but are there plans to take this story further in more books? Which uh, particular? Uh, I guess I would say the Nimza story or uh, the Breakaway Civilization story. Oh, well, you know, as it comes up in the uh, in research, I do. It will. But uh, I never decide ahead of time, okay, I'm going to like do this series of books and there's going to be 10 of them. And then I find things to fill those 10. I don't do that. I honestly, the books I do are, you know, if some, if a little thread or something pops up in research for another book, I'll set it aside. Then I'll go back to it. And if I get enough, what I consider to be evidence to justify the book, um, I'll do the book, but I'll never do a book just to have a book, uh, which is why it's been, you know, six, you know, almost nine months since I came out with a book. <laughs> I had two others that I'd started and I just wasn't finding enough to justify it. And I won't do that. I won't do a book just to crank out a book and have a book. Respectable. Um, yeah. I, I try to have it be something that intrigued me enough that I feel there was enough there to justify this book. Now the reader has to decide for themselves whether that's true or not. Hell yeah, man. I think you do great stuff from Disney to Del Show. I'm into all of it. Thank you. You really have opened up a big part of history, I think. So thanks again, and take care of yourself out there. Thank you for having me on. You got it, man. Sweet son of Zorn, people. There we have it. A magnifying glass on some chapters of the story few have seen. I actually loved it. I think if we reject the desire for a single narrative, you can easily accept a lot of this without moving the alien piece or the multidimensional entity piece at all. And if you liked the show with Shaman Janir a few weeks ago, this is just a deeper look at some of that. And it's the connections to alchemy or material derived from the ether that really gets me pumped up about the Sonora Aero Club. That's what I find exciting. But when you pair this with, say, the James Corbett episode, where we talk largely about the advanced transportation systems and alternative fuel that were in full swing before they were suppressed, and you throw in Tesla, Wilhelm Reich, and Thomas Townshed Brown, who were all doing wild stuff in the early 1900s, the history of technological process gets kind of weird, doesn't it? Another aspect I like about power or technology derived from alchemy or counter-rotation devices or manipulating ley lines as opposed to our mechanical digital technology is that secret societies or rogue discoverers can do some really wild things. And at many different points in history, things the mainstream think would be impossible even today happened. And we're talking about anti-gravity, healing devices, free energy devices, weather manipulation with devices that aren't that hard to build. It's a lot, but it's because of the simplicity of these things that you have to wonder how far back it really goes. And how about this idea of manipulating the earth into a gold factory? We see these ancient cities plated in gold from top to bottom, and yeah, maybe the resource was just more abundant then, or maybe they were more advanced than we're told. Maybe they had more involvement in that process than just, oh, here's something shiny, let's make a statue. I think we should give them a bit more credit than that. But this saga also speaks to this Prussian-German power center and how it was getting its hooks into America even before Operation Paperclip, way before. We're talking Civil War stuff. It was this earlier foundation that made the transition for Operation Paperclip so easy. 
And I know this is a weird place for conspiracy thinkers because we want a singular narrative about who's at the top of the pyramid and the overwhelming majority will say Jews are in control through centuries of banking and usury and now they control the media and between the two, money and media, that's a lot of power. There's also the argument that Jews have been kicked out of a lot of places well before World War II. Some would say that this is proof of their centuries-old persecution and racism. But I have a hard time thinking that they were kicked out of these places for no reason other than racism. It seems more likely to me that elements of the Jewish elite, not the average Jewish people, who of course suffered the effects of such a ban, but the Jewish power center. It feels like to me elements of that Jewish power center were probably so efficient at rising to power in these places that it freaked out the rest of the government. So they said, all you gotta go, get the fuck out of here. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying, I think that that might've been what's behind it objectively. And of course, you have a lot of stuff there with the Rothschild family too. You can say that they're not real Jewish people or posers. You can have that argument and that's kind of its own thing. So I think there is something there that a lot of researchers are onto. But we cannot ignore this German and Prussian elite and their influence. You got some shows in the conspiracy space that say it's all Jews and the Germans and the Nazis were wrongfully demonized. And I think that's going way too far. Let's examine a couple of things. Henry Ford and Rockefeller were two of the big names among the early American industrialists. And Rockefeller was German. Henry Ford's dad was Irish, so that doesn't really help us out. But Henry Ford wrote a book called the International Jews that goes over how bad they are and how they like to get their hooks in everything and take over a place. So Henry Ford, the guy who works with Rockefeller to install an assembly line lifestyle in America and ushers in forced schooling aimed at testing loyalty to its management class rather than testing intelligence, plus the suppression of public transportation systems and forcing an oil-only fuel policy, I mean, this seems like some of the biggest changes that were made and problems that this country has, and Henry Ford is involved in it, and he wants you to worry about what the Jews are doing. So I think we should just say that it's not all black and white. I mean, the Bush family. We did that show with Russ Baker taking their family back to civil war corruption, also a German family, and they churned out two presidents, one who stole the election and ushered in 9-11. But don't look at the Germans. I mean, you know, you can say... They are Zionists too, so maybe this German-Jew false dichotomy is as ridiculous as Democrats and Republicans. I think it's more rich versus poor. I have said that before, but we're getting into some shit here. I mean, MK Ultra, Operation Paperclip, the rocketry program, and NASA, the chemical-based pharmaceutical industry, the education system, these are institutions of control that are largely German in nature, or German corporations. So I think we have to consider multiple power centers in more of a Game of Thrones scenario. I don't know. I think it's more valuable to point the finger at individuals rather than groups anyway. And at the capstone level, I think they probably just see the masses as the enemy, regardless of if they share blood with them or not. But I did want to lay some of that out there because there will be comments. Oh, so it's all Germans. Sure, ignore the Jews. Well, looks like THC is compromised. <laughs> And look, we do shows where we talk about that with guests who research that story, and we have guests who focus on several other groups. Today, we focused on a Prussian hermetic society and its influence and its advanced technology behind the veil. I mean, there's nothing necessarily nefarious about flying some exotic crafts, but it is more than just that, of course. So I don't know. I don't think these are contradictory threads. I have enough room in my head for both and probably more. And I've taken a couple shots at Flat Earthers lately, and some of the listeners that adopted that paradigm have taken offense, and the reason I poke fun at them is because in the six or so years I've been doing this show, there's never been a more close-minded group. That is my problem, because THC, to me, is about having a drink and a smoke and talking about some taboo and fringe ideas and information, like a stoner's digital speakeasy. And we try on many hats, some fit better than others. And next week, we will look at something else, or take a different angle. And the Flat Earth community as a whole seems like they've made up their mind, they know all the answers, and they're closed off to any other discussion, and I just reject that. It's like the material sciencism thing. There have to be other discussions. And when I hear, nope, this guy's talking about Mars, Mars isn't real, I just want to lose my mind. 
When people are so sure about basically unknowable things, I just go nuts. You can think NASA photographs are all CGI. You can think the rover missions were faked in the desert. And that the light in the sky that we call Mars is just something other than a planet. But to adopt that as your new religion and shut down any discussion that suggests there's a red planet out there is so close-minded that you're no better than someone in the mainstream who rolls their eyes at the other topics that we go over. Where is the open-minded attitude? This really isn't some race to a conclusion finish line. It's an ever-expanding cloud of ideas, and over time, forms will take shape and others will fade away, and we'll get pictures that are more accurate as they go and might change radically year after year. At least that's how I look at it and want it to be looked at. But things do take on a life of their own. So that was a lot of rambling about somewhat unrelated things. But if you like the first half of this show, we do go deeper in the members only second hour as well. We get into the story that Tesla built a ship that could get to Mars before 1910 and how the new context of the Sonora Aero Club and the NIMSA adds fuel to that fire. I mean, these people who think we have a jump room to Mars now, who went there to install the landing pad? Maybe this is what we're talking about. But we also get into Walter's Sir Richard Francis Burton book and expeditions to South America and lots of gold and airship sightings at that time that coordinate with Prussian exploration, all sorts of stuff. And you know the drill. Sign up for Plus. It's five bucks a month. You get five shows. Keeps my dream alive. And you can treat yourself to a deeper level of these THZ interviews. That's it for me. You're all God's special snowflakes. I'll see you next week. Your move, esoteric alchemists, benefactors of the Sonora Saucer Society, and secret keepers of NIMSA. Your fucking move. Have a drink and a smoke. Listen to the cast. We shine a shiny spotlight. Put criminals on blast. The pinstripe men of morning and families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. We're looking for the answer to questions never asked. So we come to the Carwood for the higher side chats. The pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild The kids don't stand a chance The kids don't The kids don't stand The kids don't stand a chance I said the kids don't The kids don't stand The kids don't stand a chance shady business we try to get a glance we're working on the numbers resistance must advance the pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance dupont windsor and rothschild the kids don't stand a chance the kids don't the kids don't stand the kids don't stand a chance i said the kids don't the kids don't stand the kids don't stand a chance the kids don't the kids don't stand